Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Fisayo Oluwadia. How are we doing? You're doing great. How are you? Uh, I'm excited about this one. Uh, you know, this is another one that, you know, working with some different team members that have helped me find phenomenal guests for the show. Uh, but before we get into the company, Fisayo, please give us a little background. Who are we talking to today? Give us a little bit of uh, your entrepreneurial experience. What have you been doing so far? Okay, so I'm actually a baby entrepreneur. I've been working, <laughs> I've been working for large organizations my entire life. I am an engineer code on hands-on, 18 years. I am not stopping. I will code to the day I die. Um, and I finally, about a year and a couple months ago, said, you know what? You've been doing this for a long time for other people. It's probably about time you actually try to do this for yourself. And this decision came at about the same time that OpenAI launched so i'm thinking and everybody is doing ai ai ai, AI. so i'm like okay i'm gonna jump on that bad one and do ai so that's how i got into entrepreneurship and that's me see i love it finally people are understanding that ai ai that we've been doing in the spanish songs for so often is finally come to fruition and has taken over the world but <laughs> not in the way we anticipated i'll tell you that so tell us a little bit about your current venture your current business and what inspired you to pursue this particular entrepreneurial endeavor Sure. So my current product is Rizakli. My company as a whole is okay. Um, we provide technology solutions for the food industry in particular, but for the hospitality industry as a whole. Um, core, first core product is Rizakli. It's an AI ML restaurant and dish recommendation platform. It's dual marketplace from an EDA perspective. And from the restaurant perspective, it is a data, it provides data analytical services and tools so that restaurants can make data-driven decisions about their menus. So think about it. I'm collecting all of this information from eaters about their dietary preferences, things they like and they dislike, um, things they are allergic to. So if I have all of that information, we can answer simple questions like, I'm located in the zip code where I'm running a steakhouse and everybody's a vegan. I might want to just think a little bit, right? Makes sense. Uh, so things along things along that nature, questions along that nature is what were is what I'm trying to answer. I'm trying to provide tools to help restaurants answer those questions because the goal ultimately is if you're being smarter about what you're putting, if you're being smarter about what it is you're putting on the menu, you can most likely drive down the you can increase the sorry, can you give me just one moment? Yep. Yeah. I am so sorry about no, that. You're fine. I was at the door. Um, so I was saying, yes, by providing these tools, we're hoping that they can use data to essentially make smarter decisions about the dishes they put on their menu, which will hopefully bring in more people into their restaurants and increase the satisfaction rates that um, these customers coming in to dine, um, these customers coming to dine enjoy. Um, I got into it because I'm actually a food writer outside of coding. And when I was thinking about, okay, I should have my own product. I was thinking, okay, let's work in the serious industries. I started my career in finance. It's like, let's create an AI tool in finance. Came up with something, built it. I was not interested in staying the course of it. So I was like, forget it. I'm not going to do this. <laughs> then I built something in medicine. I was like, wow, this is a game changer. But I'm probably going to commit to this for like three months. And then it's like, no, I can't do this anymore. I'm bored. So what do I really want to do that I feel like I'm obsessed with? I can commit my life to doing. So I'm obsessed yeah. with food and wine and dining experiences. And I'm also a coder. How can we do something great at that intersection? And that's where the idea for exactly came up because I'm like, I'm a food writer, I'm recommending restaurants. So essentially my brain is a recommendation engine. Let's go ahead and do that. That, so that is so fascinating. So like, I mean, okay, let's, let's break this down. So how let's, 
let's think about the human human nature of the the world, right? So how can AI meet the unpredictable nature of human taste? Oh, I mean, can it meet the unpredictable nature of every single human? Probably not. But if you actually dissect it down to data, ones and twos, what is it you're thinking about when you say, I like this restaurant? Okay, it's because you like dishes and you like drinks and you probably like the chef. Okay, great, we have that. Now break it down. What is it when you say, I like this dish? Okay, it has this ingredient you have, or it's this cuisine you like. Or it doesn't include this, which you hate with a passion. Break it down again. That's a question. So essentially, I was able to take all of these questions and all of these requirements and dissect it down to zeros and ones, which a computer understands. And when you now use AI into it, when you put AI into it and you provided enough data to train your model, all of that gray area that we're thinking, oh my goodness, how does OpenAI and ChatGPT know exactly what I'm asking? That's what my data is providing. So obviously the more data I get, the more I train my model, the better it's gonna get on that unpredictability and it's gonna be on that, oh my God, how did I figure it out? But ultimately it comes down to the data points and the zeros and ones. I am constantly, constantly um, evaluating my model and training my model and getting more data points. Um, but ultimately in the end, it's just going to these restaurants and thinking about what is the experience that I'm having that's saying I like this restaurant and I like this dish and translating it down to data and feeding it into my model. You know, the beautiful thing about data is data will always give you, uh, it'll never give you what you need, but it'll, ever, it'll always give you what you, it'll never give you what you want, but it'll always give you what you need, right? Yeah. Um, because it's funny with data, you kind of assume or you want it to tell you a specific story sometimes. Uh, but but it never it never gives you that full pain uh, pain of it always, and so it's interesting to utilize AI to kind of help illustrate that pain. Now now, who is the primary customer? Would it be the dining restaurants, or is it a consumer like myself? Can I use it like a Yelp? Well, it would be either way. Um, this product is actually anti Yelp because I'm trying. <laughs> to I mean, Yelp is, for, Yelp is for who Yelp is for. It's not for me. And I'm just like, it's not fair. When you, I'm very much a proponent of restaurants. And it's not fair when you go on there and you see some of the things people write, especially when it's for like new and young restaurants. It's like you could shut them down. Restaurant yeah, closure. It's very true. Restaurant closure, it's already said at 30% in the first year. And then you're going and putting this out there. Come on, give them a break. So, I'm definitely a very restaurant uh, proponent, but people can come on here and use it from an extreme personalization level, um, a street extreme personalization perspective, because that's actually even one of the ways I got into it because I was thinking, okay, I'm a food writer. I'm going out every night, sometimes three, four restaurants a night, spending a lot of money at all of these places. So I can find one or two that I'm really going to hone in, focus on, revisit again and write about. How about I actually have my tool, which will actually do that streamlining so I don't have to visit 20 restaurants in a week. I can actually just have the tool say, okay, we already have all the things that you normally go to. Go visit these ones for your final concrete. So back to your question, who is this for? It's for eaters, more discerning eaters who are looking for extreme personalization in their dining experiences because think about it today everybody has some sort of dietary restriction and they're on today this person is a vegan tomorrow this person is allergic to nuts even though they're not they're not allergic to nuts they just don't like it so basically taking all of that into the mindset and applying it that is the eater side of things then we have the restaurant side of things right so the restaurants have a completely different view they have tools along the lines of what I gave as an example initially. You have information about the eater and you make a data-driven menus. But a feature we're actually building right now is very much like there's competitive analysis that's, that we're doing in there. There's recipe, rec recipe generation engines that we're putting in there. All of this is driving ultimately into do this and you will get this result. And with this result, you will hopefully stay open even longer and make more better. You know, that's, that's a great point. And I think, you know, it, it, 
It's interesting how AI continues to evolve and it continues to create innovation based on, again, this is based on the principles of the individual that creates the code for the AI, right? And so it's also important in, in the what it wants it to learn and how it wants it to learn. Now, based on you, you're in the restaurant industry. You also, you mentioned an engineer, so you're writing the code. What does the future of AI innovation in the dining experience look like? What 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 can what can I, me as a consumer expect in the next couple of years? I mean, ultimately, it is just what I've said: extreme personalization. Because right now, you have people who go into the restaurants. It's like a fifteen minute conversation with the waitress. I like this. I don't like that. I like that. I don't like that. So there's definitely that extreme personalization. It's going to go from one or two people to everybody's expecting it. It's already started. So we're going to have that same time. People want more transparency because everybody is, is um, becoming healthier as far as what they dine and what they consume. And they want the transparency in the source of ingredients, so on and so forth that they're getting that they're about to put into their body. So we need definitely a more, we need um, deeper insight to where our sources of food are coming from to the actual true health um, health impacts of what we're eating. We need more truth in that. So I definitely see there's going to be a whole lot more transparency required in that regard, as far as the food industry is concerned. And that's another point where that's another point where uh, tech and AI is going to come into play. Somebody actually was like, you know, they're actually using blockchain in, su um, in supply chain. They're using blockchain in supply chain right now. I was like, Interesting. Wow. how are you doing that? Yeah. Essentially, they're using it to map and to track where everything is being imported from. Oh, makes sense. You're basically able to look at a dish, and if you have access to that entire train, you can yeah. say, oh, I came from 20 different places, <laughs> you know? And it's that kind of transparency that I think people are going to want. They're going to be particularly anal about that going forward. You know, it's in it's interesting because um, I'm, I like, I would say I'm a... a junior foodie, right? I'm, I'm starting to really in, indulge myself in different cuisines and very, you know, really, really venturing out. Um, now, with that said, folks, do not judge me, but I will say I still love myself a beautiful Red Robin burger. And I will admit that on the table, they have they have this little uh, TV kind of thing, right? The menu. And so it's like, to your point, they kind of have an AI kind of system, you know, it's already here. We just may not have noticed it before because as you're as you're you know explaining this, I'm starting to think of that damn golden those royal red robin burgers right now. And I'm like, oh, I can actually just order it right there. And then when I can check out right there and I don't have to, you know, all of these things. And so it is interesting how it is kind of evolving. Now, let's take a step back. You know, let's let's take a step. Can, can you take us back to the beginning? It, it kind of seems like this is in fact the beginning entrepreneurial journey for you. But you're also in a, two very, very, you know, predominantly Caucasian industries. As a black female founder, journeying in the food tech industry, break it down for us. How has your experience been? Um, honestly, because I'm in the tech industry as a coder. I haven't had any impacts because ultimately in the tech industry, it's all about what your brain is. What now, when I first start and I join the company, people do in fact think I'm a diversity hire. It's like black woman who can code claiming she has all of this experience. Come on up. She can't do anything. They hired her because she's black. And then sure enough, I get myself on every critical path project, bringing it early. I say a project was slated for six months. I get it done in one. People tend to shut up. And let me do my job. So with that, from the actual coding perspective, I'm perfectly fine with that. Now, I definitely do recognize that a lot of people have challenges, um, not only being not only being Black, I'm Nigerian, I'm African, not only doing that or being a woman, because this industry as um, coding, it is definitely, it definitely is required. It requires a lot of you because you have to be moving at the speed of light brain power wise. So you definitely have a lot of people doubting and questioning. So it can be a little bit hard, but I'm someone who actually rises to the challenge. I enjoy this. Um, there isn't an industry in the world that allows me to be as vocal <laughs> as I am in the tech industry as a creator. 
um, without any repercussions, so to speak, because that open communication, um, that open communication is something that's required as a part of the job. So from the perspective of being a coder, that's not something that I have particularly faced an issue with. From the perspective of being a food writer, fair enough. I have lots of people who think I don't know what I'm talking about, who think I don't know what I'm doing, because I am definitely a standout. I go into all of these restaurants and it's like, people are really quite rude and disrespectful, tapping me on the shoulder when I have my headphones on and saying, what are you celebrating today? It's like, why do you do this? <laughs> You don't do that to other people. That's disrespectful. You invaded my my personal space. So I definitely have those experiences, but I feel like for a for a while I felt like it's my job to do this to educate beyond my just going in and experiencing and writing. It's my job to educate. It's my job to expose. It's my job to say, hey, no, 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 no. I am not one in a million. There are actually people like me. And to share, not only to get go in there and get the information I need to write about the restaurants, but to also share with the fellow patrons and give them an example. Okay, fine, you haven't seen someone like me before, but congratulations, now you have. So the next time you meet someone that looks like me at a restaurant, you're not disrespecting their personal space by tapping them and say, hi, what are you celebrating, you know? Yeah, no, I, I I get it. I get it. And I think um, anytime you start any venture, uh, you know, no matter your diversity or ethnicity, sometimes you're going to have haters, folks. There are going to be people out there that just disagree with what you're doing. Sometimes it doesn't matter about your skin color or your sexual orientation. Some people, I hate to say it, they're just assholes. Uh, and they just like to be, you know, they just like to be those kind of people that you get a rise out of people and don't let them because then they win. Uh, and you certainly can persevere through these things. In fact, uh, you know, entrepreneurship comes with its fair share of challenges, right? Could you share some of your significant hurdles that you've encountered when you're starting your own business? I think the biggest one that I faced is um, financing. I didn't really mm. know what to do from the world of financing, because every time um, I heard about it, it's like, okay, TechCrunch, this person got funded a hundred million. Oh, this person is valued at 2 billion. And I'm like, I, I just need a million and I'm good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, so financing, as soon as I had the idea, I scheduled a call um, with an expert. He's someone who, um, who, in, who it, well, he's an expert. He's someone who invests in the food industry quite a bit. Um, so there's this app called Intro, and I use it a lot. Basically, you can schedule calls with people who are experts in their industry and just basically have a conversation. They can give you feedback, information. Um, so I saw him on there, and I was like, oh, wow, I actually know you. You're on Shark Tank. You're in the food industry. Great. I actually know who this person is. So let's schedule a call with him. Schedule the call. Pitch the idea. He was like, oh, that's great. Build it and come back to me. Didn't give me any money. Just said build the product. I'm like, yeah, this is expensive, but the money is coming. So I built, 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 built. Was done in three months, went back to him, and he ghosted me. Meanwhile, I've signed up for three-year contracts with Google so I can host my platform because if you sign committed use, uh, for that long, you get significant discounts. And it's like, okay, the discount, I can actually afford to keep this thing up. So there was that. That was an epic failure. That was disappointing to me. And I put myself in a predicament. And then there were the others who would basically smile in your face, say, yeah, everything is, everything is great. We're going to sign it off and, and get you the money tomorrow. And then they disappear. And of course, as a woman looking for money there are those other interesting characters I don't need to actually mention what they're doing you get the gist of it so between all of that I just came to the point where I said um, I'm really not going to go down this path of trying to find money for my company I'm just going to fund it uh, for myself fast forward maybe six months when I'm sharing these concerns and these grievances with somebody else, 
um, in the startup industry, and they were like, yeah, this is completely normal. I'm like, how can this be normal? So that really, like, this is just, this is disgusting. That really has been my big core point and pain point as far as entrepreneurship is concerned, finding financing. But I'm lucky that I've gotten to a position where I have it balanced. I'm like, okay, I'm good. I'm good for at least four years as far as this is concerned before I have to go look for money. Um, but all of that said and done, um, that has definitely been my biggest challenge as far as finding financing. But I am really, really happy if I'm being completely honest that I never got it. <laughs> because going at the pace that I'm going, I can go at my own pace. It's only my decisioning. I don't have to listen to anybody else where I'm saying, great, I took money from you and I have to listen to you now. <laughs> So very true. Yeah. Very true. I think, I think that's a big, you know, I think that's a good point to bring up because you, I've, I'm working with a lot of entrepreneurs and we're actually going through a pitch competition here in Seattle in a couple of weeks. Uh, actually it'll be after this, uh, it'll be before this episode airs, but you know, one of the things we discuss, you know, venture capitalists, their, their goal really is to kind of get, kind of get your business and then sell the business. Um, and you report to them, you, you actually sell a part of your business to acquire that funding. Uh, and I, I, you know, your venture capitalists will take a bunch of meetings uh, all day long. Um, and they will, by all means, they'll love you, send you the pitch deck, send the pitch deck. Right. Um, but the likelihood they're going to call you back isn't very high. And so that's why, you know, one thing I always, always encourage our, our pitchers is, you know, one, try to figure out a way to grass root it one, but then also figure out a way to engage the community in your growth of your business, because they become your actual founder, they become your angel investors, right, without having to give up your, uh, your equity in your business, because they're actually purchasing the product or service that you're selling, right, versus you actually selling equity in your business. So you know, venture capitalist is great, if you want to go that route, it's not always the prejudice, it is it is difficult, um, there's a lot of no's before a lot of yeses. Uh, but you know, it's it's certainly I think every entrepreneur goes that route. And and, and it, unfortunately, they do realize pretty quick, I'm like, Oh, yeah, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of these big uh, unicorns, you hear about them, but there's what you don't hear about is all those mules that are behind it, you know, <laughs> so so to speak. Now walk us now walk us through the strategies and efforts that you employ to build this current business. Like what what is your brand strategy like? Okay, so that actually is something that I am actually only now focusing on because for uh for pretty much the better part of how much time I spend on it, it's just been building the platform. Like I built and coded everything on my own. I only in January, actually started bringing on resources because I wanted to focus on the branding and getting everything out there. So um, my brand strategy right now, it's very, very digital market heavy. Um, and since this is digital marketing heavy, and since this is a um, dual marketplace product, I'm saying if I focus on B2C and I get the numbers on B2C, I will very, very easily get the B2B onboarded. Now, with the digital marketing strategy, this is something that we're still talking about, but it's along the lines of bringing people in organically, um, maybe something towards, and I really don't like this term, but it get, keeps on getting pushed at me. Um, they said make it exclusive and exclusivity aspect of it instead of how I have it as a grassroots, everybody is welcome. I want everyone to use it. I want everybody to get feedback. A lot of the direction I'm getting across different parties is to not open it up like that. I'm a very open person, so I'm definitely building in public in this right. product right now. It's very MVP and I'm pushing everybody, hey, come use it. Um, but I'm getting direction opposite of that to not do that. Um, so there's that. But the brand, honestly, the brand message that I'm trying to put out there is mostly towards the restaurants. I am not fighting the restaurants. I am your supporter. Because people will think, oh, tech and AI, it's going just the way AI is ruining, and is ruining some industries and jobs are being taken away. There's a fear that comes with it. And it's like, no, I'm actually not going to do that. I am supporting. I am a tool. I know of only one restaurant 
so far that has converted into complete AI, but the robot grills burgers, that's it. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, I'm building tools to make you more money to get more bets and seats. So my focus and my brand is very much on putting out there that I'm here. I am the support system for restaurants. On the dining perspective, my brand is essentially to say, let's actually create something new as far as the experience of food and dining is, because this does not exist. So that's what my brand is accord, um, across these two marketplaces. Now, there are, other, there are definitely other um, other personas, because either a restaurant persona, that's what I'm talking about, but there are other personas and there are other brand strategies that I'm having discussions about, but I'm keeping those on the hush hush secret. We're not talking about those just yet. Yeah, no, I love it because I think essentially what, you know, I've kind of already envisioned it in my head, right? Your kind of growth market strategy where you have your B2B on one and then you have B2C on the other. And basically you have, you know, year one, year two is your immediate, you know, growth strategies. And then year two is your year two to year three, year four is your intermediate. And then year five, six is like your long-term goals, right? Except each one, each segment has their own intermediate, immediate, and long-term goals. And then now you're basically starting to create your sales funnel within those goals, right? Okay. Now, how do we get to create the awareness? How do we get the retention? How do we get to a loyalty? No. And I'm like, I love it because it's like, I think this is important for people to understand because this is exactly the mind of an entrepreneur and how it should be working when you start a business is you're not just starting like, you know, you want proof of concept, right? First and foremost, and then minimal viable product. You said MVP, minimal viable product. You want to basically get something out there for people to test, to get to that product market fit, to, uh, to even say, hey, hey, does this, do I have the proof of concept, right? So you get to the MVP, which is your minimum viable product, your minimal thing that you can actually extend onto the market and say, hey, please test this. And then once they test it, then you start to determine if you have a product market fit, right? And the beauty of it is you're doing your minimum, minimum viable product. You're not getting all the, all the bells and whistles yet. You're just seeing if the concept works. And that's what you're at. And then, and then from there, then you can kind of start thinking, okay, now how do I get this out to the masses? The concept works. Now, now what do I do, right? Exactly. And that's, and that, that, that's where I am right now. That's why I started the podcast circuit. It was actually yet another person that I met on the intro app. And he was like, you really... You should do podcasts, not only because of the product, but because you're just weird and interesting. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, so that's how I got on the podcast circuit. And so Thank far, goodness. so good as far as getting people onto the platform to use it and to give me feedback. I'm really just enjoying that honest feedback that I'm getting right now. Obviously, I want more feedback and more people on the platform, but I'm enjoying the organic level that I'm at right now. Man, I feel like I need to change my uh, tagline for the podcast now. <laughs> the weird and interesting come to the shades of entrepreneur. <laughs> I get them all, people. <laughs> now, so we talked about some of the challenges, uh, you know, about the business. What? Are, what? Let's talk about some of the rewarding moments. What are some of the aspects that you have found relatively easy or enjoyable building this company? I mean, I think, well, obviously the easy part has been the coding. Um, now, the coding, that's the easy part. But basically building a platform and building software is more than writing the code. I already knew that off of my tens of years, <laughs> my tens of years in the industry that there's a whole lot more that goes into building software than just writing the code. But it's one thing to know that. It's another thing to be really thrown into the deep throes of it. So it's like, okay, I always knew infrastructure. I was always able to have a conversation with people on infrastructure. But now I actually have to understand what are VPNs and subnets and Kubernetes clusters. And it's like, okay, I know it, but wow. My hand's about to explode with all these damn acronyms. You're throwing out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> you lost me at VPN. That's about the only thing I have to deal with at work. And God, I hate that damn thing, but I still deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> you, oh, went, okay. you went alphabet soup on these people <laughs> coder for life coder for life man uh, but essentially actually having to go knee deep or toe claw whatever deep in all of these aspects of building software the hardware the front end the back end the infrastructure the product 
the whole ecosystem and it's just me I had times where I was like okay you know what maybe you really should just give up but then I'd wake up the next I and out of frustration I'd go to bed and then I'd wake up the next morning at my wonderful 5 a.m alarm rain is clear not foggy and it's like who is giving up you're not giving up you never give up and then I jumped right back into it so I was like going through that three months of that. I hit month three. Certainly, yes, after that, everything didn't work out. But to actually have the product standing and I did everything by myself, that was incredibly satisfying and validating. And I think that's why, obviously, I was disappointed by Mr. Money Man disappearing. But <laughs> <laughs> I just felt so accomplished by that. It's like, you know what? I'm going to keep on going with this. I'm definitely going to keep on going with this. Um, So that was satisfying point number one. And then just going out to these restaurants, I mean, obviously dining as far as going out and reviewing and all of that is my job. But now having this different talking point of what my tech company is, first place going to the bar, sitting down saying, yeah, I own a tech company. <laughs> great incredibly validating um but then having this talking point of talking about my product with bartenders with fellow diners with restaurant managers just getting that immediate feedback like how come this doesn't exist like this is such a cool idea it's just it's so rewarding every time now I go out and I'm so happy and proud to talk about it. And I'm always getting that feedback. Now, obviously I need you to actually sign up for the platform, but getting that product market <laughs> <laughs> verbal. Go ahead in there real verbal. quick. <laughs> <laughs> the verbal fit. Uh, getting that. Um, very, really, really incredibly satisfying and rewarding. Um, and then I think the third part now is, as I mentioned, now I'm bringing I'm bringing up on an engineering team to handle that part because I now have to refocus on all of the other company aspects, marketing, CEO, CFO, all of these things that also flow into becoming, into running a company. Taking the time to actually understand this, this space, which is completely new to me, and finding satisfaction and joy because I actually own the company. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing. Yeah, no, it, it I, I sounds, I, again, uh, it, I think it's important to also know that it didn't happen overnight, right? And it, it probably is a lot of work, but man, the, the satisfaction of it is always nice. You know, uh, I, I, I got to tell you, it's not easy though. I, again, folks, I'm a, I feel like I'm a failed entrepreneur. I'd say, you know, I started my clothing line, did it for four years, started another, you know, now we did the, the nonprofit. We're very successful with the nonprofit right now. And some people will say, well, that's not a business. No folks, I'm hiring people. We're, we're raising money. It's it. We run it like a dang business. It's, it's very, very challenging, but there's a lot that goes into it. Now you pivoting from a principal engineer to a founder. What are some of those big picture lessons that you learned? One, and then two, what advice would you give aspiring entrepreneurs today? Um, pivoting from a principal engineer to a founder made the transition easy, actually. Because when you are at that level in any organization, you are required to be everywhere and to have your tentacle. You're required to know everything and have your tentacles everywhere, which is why I was saying, okay, well, when I speak to infrastructure, okay, I understand your speak. I'm not actually doing it, but I understand your speak. Now take it from, I understand your speak as a principle to, no, I'm building an entire co um, company based off of the little speak I had. So it made things easier, that transition. Now, being a principal engineer, you can talk to business for five minutes, but actually what business strategies are, what marketing strategies are, what um, balance, well, you know what a balance sheet is if you manage your money, but what actually entails that from a company perspective, being a principal engineer doesn't expose you to that part at all. So that part is the part that was new, but I'm still able to to I was still able to approach all these different roles with the same mindset that I do as a principal engineer, which is basically take things from the one-liner 
and break it down into the detail so you can speak about your one-liner, not only to your engineering team, you can also communicate it to your business partners, you can communicate it to your QA engineers. That ultimately being that top level, I can speak English to everybody about a technical solution. That's what a principal does. And that's what I was able to take in to run in my company. You know, that's a very, very well stated statement because, you know, I actually was doing a pitch uh, coaching this morning. Uh, and one of the things I, I said was you have to be able to explain your product and service well enough to, a, uh, you know, a first grader should be able to understand it. Um, so, you know, using, try to refrain from using acronyms, or if you do use acronyms, just make sure you explain what it is. Uh, if you're, if, if you're bringing in a new concept, explain kind of what the concept does, right? Um, really, and it, I, again, uh, I'm not saying that folks out there are not intelligent. We are a very intelligent species, but some people, when they get introduced to a new concept on the fly, uh, it is kind of difficult for them to understand. So simplifying it, having that elevator speech is very important, right? You know, if you have an opportunity and you go two floors with, you know, one of the, the wealthiest venture capitalists of the world and you're looking for funding and you have two floors to give them your elevator speech, what are you going to tell them? All right, you got 30 seconds to basically really talk about your entire business and the value proposition in a very, very short amount of time and in, in, in a simple way that it's understandable that they don't have to ask questions and saying, well, what exactly is this, this, and this, right? Uh, and so that that's really important, but you know, it's, 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 it's very interesting to kind of see your progression. In fact, what I would love to do is you know, later on is, is bring you back. I would love to, you know, after this has grown a couple of, you know, in a year or so, bring you back, see where you have, you know, where you've, where you've grown and, and continue to see how this continues to build. Yeah. Cause I think I truly do uh, see a, a benefit of it. And I, I can see again, the anti Yelp. I also believe uh, I actually recently um, had them delete a comment of mine cause I was mad at the server, not at the actual owner. So I was like, I'm not trying to be that person, remove that thing. And they'll even ask you, like, are you sure you want to remove? It? I was like, yes, I do. And again, uh, I was mad at the individual, not at the server. So. Nonetheless, be kind on those Yelp reviews, folks, because it does affect people's jobs. And I think that's also a very good point that you made. Now, for the for the folks listening at home, they want to learn more about you or more. Maybe they want to test out the server. How do they figure How do they learn more information? Where do they go visit? Okay, so right now, exactly is a website. We are a couple weeks out from actually being in the app stores, but pretty much you just go to the website. It's um resactly r-e-s-a-c-t-l-y dot com so you go to that you can sign on to the platform you just create an account the and then it'll run you through the onboarding process where you just basically like give your information date of birth then you give your dining story which is basically i like this i hate this um and then after that it takes all of that creates a dining profile for you and ta-da you can actually use the app it's that simple and it's that straightforward now restaurants. I was going to say this was actually remove all of those those uh, tough conversations that we have with our significant others of where do we want to eat, you know that usually takes about an hour to two hours. Next thing you know, you're getting McDonald's anyways. So this might actually be a better way to actually find something new to eat as well. It sounds like. Yeah, you actually keyed me into one of the features. And when you log into the platform it's recommending restaurants for you. Like you will see restaurants recommended to you within a five mile radius. There's a distance slider so you can expand that, but that's for you. Now there is the group recommendation feature. On the group recommendation feature, you can create a group, add your friends, you add your friends, you put a search term, okay, French food in New York City. And then my wonderful, wonderful platform is then going to go ahead and search restaurants that fit your search criteria and recommend at a group level. So you will be looking at the group. It will probably say, okay, individual to you, 70% chance you'll like the restaurant. Right next to that, it says 15% chance the entire group will like the restaurant. Why? Click on that. It's going to show you who your problem child is. <laughs> perspective of okay maybe all these people have 100 and this person has a five percent but we can still convince that five percent person to say click into this restaurant see the full menu see what it says you can order so even though you're a five percent on the entire restaurant 
at least you can get this and we don't have to curb going to this restaurant because this one person doesn't like it. You will always have that person that wants to order chicken nuggets. Like, why do you all, I mean, you are an adult. You do not need to be ordering chicken nuggets anymore. They have, or chicken tenders or whatever they call them at these restaurants just to make you feel older. There is other food. And stop, stop taking off the onions from your burgers, folks, and your tomatoes. Eat your dang vegetables. It provides phenomenal flavor to those things. Uh, okay, goodness. no, 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 no. Oh, no, we're about to get into an argument. A, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a purist. <laughs> Give me the meat and the cheese. And the, you need to flatten that beef so it's nice and crispy. Mm -mm, don't talk to me about tomatoes. Yeah, so you want a smash burger, a true smash burger. Okay, well, now I got to ask, since we're talking on food, you're a food critic. What, what is what is what is the best restaurant? Where should we be going? Where where should we go if we want the best hamburger? Well, I mean that changes, right? Yeah. <laughs> like somebody, like my favorite right now because I have actually been obsessed with burgers. My favorite smash burger in New York right now is Hamburger America. I don't know where they get their beef from, but every single time it's just like, oh my god! It's not like they're doing anything different with the cheese. It's just the quality of the beef. The first time I had it, I am not lying. I teared up. <laughs> I am not even lying. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> Man, and I'm telling you folks, there's a lot of phenomenal smash burgers out here in the Pacific Northwest and the Oregon area. Um, I've I've definitely have gone to several uh, in the last couple of, you know, I'm going I'm to go ahead and say months, you know, I ain't trying to, you know, wait myself to you folks over here but man i'm telling you there is some phenomenal food in the pacific northwest and there's a lot of you know amazing chefs that are just trying to make it uh so i would definitely encourage you guys to get out there and try some food now what is what it, would you say overall what is your favorite meal uh, overall what is my favorite meal well i'm nigerian so i cook right so I definitely still have like my Nigerian food that I love. I like the jollof. I like the red stew. Um, I like dodo, which is just fried plantains. Uh, so I think no matter all these places that I travel to that I eat at and I have my food orgasms and everything, I still definitely come back down to just like good old fashioned home cooking, make myself some rice and red stew with some boiled chicken drop and drumsticks. And yeah. Man, I'm telling you, folks, uh, I'm I'm old school myself. By old school, I mean I like nothing better than a steak, medium rare. Give me some mashed potatoes on the side, and I'm good. I'm good. However, nothing beats and and, and nothing beats this. And I, I explain this to everybody. The reason nothing beats this is because of all the different things you can do, and that is a crunchy taco. Because I can make so many different meals with a crunchy taco. I can make a taco salad, I can make a tostada, I can make a taco, right? I mean, there's so many different ways you can do it. Or you can just eat the meat as a salad. I mean, there's, a, again, and it has all of the ingredients. She has onion, tomatoes, cilantro, all these all these beautiful green and red and colors. And then you put some sour. Now I'm getting hungry. Jeez, now see, we got us. Now we always, we, we've digressed so quickly. We've digressed. Man. <laughs> now, does. I know. Was, now, now, is there any last words you'd like to uh, tell the guests before we leave? I mean, I guess maybe just putting a point out there for entrepreneurs and how they should find their ideas and progress. I can't tell you how to find the idea, but I definitely will say follow your passion because I know that's always like anti-advice that don't follow your passion, do what is supposed to work and will make money. But I know for me, there's no way I would have continued this journey to be where I am today with this product. And I'm still going because I know I'm still at the beginning. There's no way I would have stayed the path without saying I'm going to do something that I'm passionate about, that my heart is into it. Now, I know there are certain people who say, okay, that's an old archaic, um, that's an old and archaic way to do things. So that's, uh, that's a product to build for that marketplace. But if you don't have, at least to me, if you don't have that passion behind it, that's just going to be one of those things that, okay, money's run out, I'm out. You know, I agree. I agree. You, you certainly have to have the passion uh, to do this because 
There are a lot of late nights and long days. Uh, and folks, if, if you are interested, this is a great time to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. All this information will be on the shadesofe.com. So if you visit the shadesofe.com, go ahead and click subscribe to the newsletter. Or if you're interested, I, I know uh, Fisayo mentioned that she's not able to help you with an idea, but I have an idea. It's called Patreon. And if you would be so kind to join our Patreon, I actually wrote a book. And if for a small amount of $5 a month, you can actually go ahead and support the, uh, pay, uh, the podcast. And I will send you the free book that I wrote that has absolutely no value, I think. But it does go over mind mapping, which actually is a really cool little exercise to kind of think of business ideas and find your passion uh, with that as well. It actually came from the IDO. So I can't, you know, it can't from Stanford, this D school, phenomenal group. I cannot take ownership of them, but I did ask if I can use it in my book and they did give me approval. So please go check it out. Uh, it's really cool on Patreon. And if and again, more information by visiting the shades of e.com, you can also follow us on the social sites by visiting uh, at the shades of E or you can also stream this episode on YouTube by searching for the shades of entrepreneurship. Visayo, thank you so much again for your time i really do appreciate it i please once you do get the app going send it my way i want to use it i'm in portland i'm a foodie i me and my wife are always looking for new places to try out and we're always very picky about what we eat so it sounds like this is exactly what we need for all those other people thank you and have a great night